start when the dancing yeah. begins. Jim, <laughs> first you do three rounds. In the first round, you'll be the observer. But each round will have an observer. You'll okay. be the observer for round That's one. Perfect. Does everyone else have a partner? Yeah. Great. So we're going to do a simulation. In this simulation, all of you are uh, employees to my company, uh, new employees to my company, and this is our new employee training. Right? And so what happens is for the um, uh, what we're doing with new employee training is we're going to teach you how to build our three key product lines. Right? So the very first product line is going to be our elbow product. Right? And so here's how you build the elbow product. Jim, if I could borrow you for a minute. So what you'll do is you'll stand in front of your partner. What you'll do is you'll clap your hands together and then touch elbow. Hand together, <laughs> other elbow. Hand, thigh, hand, other thigh. So I'll show you once again. Clap, elbow, clap, elbow, clap, thigh, clap, Five, clap, other elbow. There you go. So remember, it's clap, elbow, clap, elbow, clap, five, clap, five, clap, elbow. Okay. Everyone got that? <laughs> With your partner, practice doing that twice. When you're done, just stop and raise your hand. Congratulations, that's our very first product line. That's the elbow <laughs> What I'd like you to do now is to find a brand new partner. And what we'll do this time, Jim, uh, Jim. let me have you stand in here. Can I have a volunteer okay. step out? <laughs> okay, so uh, what's your name? Anke. Anke. So Jim will sit in, Anke will step out. Can everyone find a brand new partner? Everyone find a brand new partner. So walk around and find a brand new Oh, she's too conservative. Oh, you guys can't work together. So uh, someone swap with uh, over here. Okay. There you go. There you go. Okay, great. So does everyone now have a brand new partner? Perfect. So what we'll do now is, uh, no. you guys remember the elbow Stable. product? Mm -hmm. I'm now going to teach you your second product. Can I get a volunteer? Uh, let me have you. What's your name? Anna. Anna. Okay. So Anna is going to help me demonstrate the second product. Our second product is our number product. So what I'll do is I'll hold up one finger. You clap once. Okay. Great. You hold up two fingers. I'll clap twice. I'll hold up three. You hold up four. All five. Great. So that's it. So that's the number product. What I'd like you to do is with your partner, practice doing that twice. You go one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five again. When you're done, just stop and raise your hand. So go ahead and practice that one more time. No, you see, you, you alternate. Yeah, so I did two. your second product we have the elbow product now we have the number product what I'd like you to do next is um, we have one last product so I'd like you to find uh, someone uh, new that you have not yet worked with this round on kid can I have you sit back in and we have another I'll ball step out. okay so you'll step out so you everyone now find a new partner don't leave me now. Mm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so you're good. You're, you're, the, so you're fine. You're the observer of this round. Right. So, uh, okay, great. So now everyone has a partner. Except for the observer. So our last product line. Uh, Matthias, how far are you from it? Yep. So our last product is um, going to be our song product. So we're going to sum it up. Now, we have to pick a song we all know. 
Everyone, I hope, knows happy birthday. If you don't know, I feel bad for your childhood. <laughs> uh, everyone knows happy birthday, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's what we'll do. I'll, I'll demonstrate. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Richard. <laughs> so when you do it, uh, make sure you wish the other person happy birthday, so find out their name. Uh, so go to the show. Do twice. Nadia? Nadia. Nadia. It was my birthday. 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 It was Well, since it would be about like seven months early. <laughs> well, Lauren can do a policy. Happy? She took over. Happy to do birthday. Birthday. You. Birthday. You. No, no, dear. No, you want to bring the second best up. I'll get with you. Happy. You. I think we got it. No, no, do it too. Why? Everyone, uh, everyone got it? Yeah. Okay, good. We're perfect. So, very nicely done. Uh, congratulations. You have successfully completed our new employee training. Welcome to the company. Give yourself a round of applause. Here's what we're going to do. Now we're going to actually get ready to work. What we have to do this quarter is we have to build a total of six elbow products, six number products, and six song products per team. Right? So each team has a total of six number products, six elbow products, six song products. By the way, everyone remember who their elbow partner is? Yes. Everyone remember who their number par partner is? This is your song partner. Now, they're all high priority. We have to do them all. Right. And so we're not going to have to take an order. But we'll do a few things to help make this a bit easier. What we'll do is you are already in your song partner. We'll start with songs. Right? Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll work off a of corporate cadence. So what you'll do is you'll, you'll do your, um, you'll build your product. But listen to my voice. If I were to say number, find your number partner. If I'm to say uh, uh, elbow, find your elbow partner. If I say song, find your song partner. Okay. And so what we'll do is we'll work out the, uh, the work out the corporate cadence. Oh, by the way, uh, just be careful, don't hurt yourselves as you okay. uh, We'll work out the corporate cadence. If you're done with all six elbows, raise your hands. If you're done with all six numbers, raise your hands. If you're done with all six songs, uh, raise your hands. If you're done with everything, raise both hands. Um, any questions? Six, six, six. Oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, to make life easier for you and so you don't lose any work, let's say you're in the middle of your song and you leave when you come back. Um, to help you guys out, don't start all over. Just pick up where you left off. So if you know your song, don't start all over. Just pick up where you left off. That's gonna make life a bit easier for you. It's <laughs> more difficult than this song. How do you know? Why did you Yeah. We start with two songs. Oh no, no, you do it exactly the same way. So, but the question is, how simple is that to be? No, there's no deviation. This is a set Very process. Simple. So it's the, it's no the stop. elbow, up, it's the elbow, elbow, <laughs> thigh, thigh, elbow. It's the happy birthday song. And it's the one through five. Okay. Right. That's the, uh, those are the products. Thanks for the One through five we will do in the sequence. Okay. So it's easier to do that. Instead of three, three, then just start off at three once you mm -hmm. get back. Yeah, when you, if you, yeah, at any Again, point when you come back, six. don't lose yeah. work, pick up where you left off. Your middle of the song, <clears throat> middle of the number, middle of the elbows, pick up where you left off. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's do it. So, uh, so you're starting with your song partner first. Just listen to my voice, I'll change it periodically. Go ahead and start. One, two, three, go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. No, so you did what I did. Scott Naga. Happy birthday to you. Birthday to you. I have to go to the solo. Birthday to you. Birthday to you. Birthday to you. Birthday to you. You should be there. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Elbows. 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 We gotta switch. Oh, okay. Watch Ready? Here you go. <laughs> 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 
What do we know? Back to where we were. It's the same song. It is the best movie <laughs> See, now we need to have some steps on there, right? Huh? Some steps. Numbers. Numbers is kind of good. Yeah. just very funny. One. Yeah. One. Two. Interruptions. Interruptions. Uh, constantly refocusing your head on a new mm -hmm. task. And well, there is that, right? Because you, you're trying to do something, right? And what after trying to get in the group, but then uh, you get pulled away to do something else, right? And that itself is kind of expensive, right? Because what happens? What did you say? Context switching is expensive. Context switching is expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happens is I'm thinking about the one task, but then I get pulled into the other task. I got to do this other task, but I might be still thinking about the previous task, so there's a bit of that. But then when I go back, remember I said, hey, don't pick, don't lose your word, pick up where you left off, right? Yes. But that itself, was that easy? Yeah. No. It sounds trivial when you say it out loud, but there's kind of that ramp up cost mm -hmm. again, right? And so that back and forth can be very expensive. Right? Mm -hmm. So what if we don't do that? What if I said, all right, let's do this. Three elbows, three numbers, three songs. Three elbows, three numbers, three songs. Would that be better? Yes. yes. Right. Welcome, come on in. Hello. Um, okay, but you're still changing partners. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's better, right? However, talk about the cost of changing partners. As a matter of fact, what happened with you two? I, I saw something where got you, separated. You, yeah, you. <laughs> you, <laughs> you guys. Yes. Yes. It was Some of you are very lucky. Right. Yeah, because we you guys are just the three of you, and you kind of you know got a little corner, and you're fine. <laughs> this little logjam middle was not so lucky. Some of you had to go much further distances. Mm -hmm. What was the cost of switching partners like? Five minute distance. Yeah. Uh, there's a thing called the Tucker model. I think I might talk about that later. But it's a team learning curve, right? And you get to work with people, then you got to work with new people, and that back and forth, that transactional cost of doing that 
is expensive too. Right? So what if we don't do that either, right? What if we don't do that either? Here's the other problem doing that too. If you had to change partners, right? Even invest, well, if you change partners, three elbows, three numbers, three songs, three elbows, three numbers, three songs, there's another kind of concurrency danger, kind of a Q danger, a weight danger, right? Because what happens if I'm done and my partner's not done? What am I waiting? What am I doing? Waiting. Waiting, right? Or let's say um, uh, my partner's ready and I'm uh, still working on it, you know, then maybe I feel bad, right? And what happens is over time, what will happen is that we, the way this is set up, what would happen is the teams over time, after few rounds, would start normalizing on the slowest person. And that just slows everything down. So a lot of this just isn't the way we do it. What's the name of that um, of that particular uh, learning curve you said? Oh, well, I'll show you that actually. It's a Tubman model. It's the uh, forming, storming, norming, oh, okay. performing model. Uh, oh, I'll show you that just a little bit. Um, so from that standpoint, let me ask you guys a question. <coughs> Who here has team members that are split across multiple teams? Raise your hand. We have team members that have team members dedicated fully to a team. Raise your hand. Who here has teams where you're off and pulled in just many directions all at once? Who here has teams where you tell a team, look, I don't care which, I don't care. It all has to be done, so you guys figure it out. Who's heard that messaging before? Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? We, we this Put simple simulation, we know that this isn't a super effective way to do it, right? Why do we do that? We're going to talk about that. Feel free to grab your seats. We'll, we'll talk about this some more. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, you guys did a great job getting through all that nonsense. Okay. So yeah, no, I think it's, those are fair points, yeah. I would also say, uh, I would add one, I don't know if that's the direction we're going with it, but you sitting smugly up in the front and just telling us all what to do for 20 minutes is also probably one that uh, maybe not having to do with the production, but with the, the, the visual for it, like, okay, we got to change again, who's making these decisions? Yeah. yeah I mean, well, if you were up front and you were the only one saying when to move, you know, we're moving. And certainly there's a bit of that too, because that is very kind of command and control-ish, right? Now command and control isn't itself necessarily bad, but you point out one of the negative effects to it is, is a sense of potential disengagement, right? Command and control with a sense of per well, I'll tell you this, direction with a sense of purpose makes sense. Direction for the sense of direction, eventually your 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 uh, sharper, more motivated, more engaged team members are gonna say, you're gonna start saying, why are we, why are we doing it this way? Right. But you could even hear the reaction from people saying, oh, like you can start hearing yeah. that the first reaction people were making was, oh, we got to change it. What would have been the best way to do this? What would have been the best way to do this? <coughs> Same partner. Same partner whole time? Mm -hmm. Same partner whole time? Good. But, but that has drawbacks, because if they don't have the same skills, the skill sets necessary for like maybe they're not coordinated or yeah. they don't sing well or whatever, then <coughs> That would be a reason why you might want to change a part. Well, I think it's a good point. Well, there's a couple things there. We'll actually talk about this. What if we get bored? Yeah. Hey, look, I've been working with uh, Jim for a while, you know, and like, you know, we're working for a while. I don't work with Jim anymore, right? Well, well, maybe yeah. that might get bored. But here's the other thing, too. Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, I, I was looking for the best solution. I, I fear that word. Um, sorry. Yeah, best solution. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, um, but. I, I think one way to do it would be, because what I noticed with uh, Francine and me is like, as soon as we got back together, we knew exactly what we were doing, yeah. right? Same thing with me and Jason. Yeah. So if, even with the 333, it yeah. wouldn't be that big of a deal as long as I didn't change my teammate, right? Well, for that product, at maybe, least for me, right? Maybe, That's why I'm saying not best. <laughs> maybe, but here's a problem, right? Yeah. It's the transaction costs of change, right? Because yeah. like we see is logic. Think about this, right? What if you, uh, so, I've worked with teams where I have team members spread across multiple teams, right? What if we're in the same floor? Okay, go here, go here. What if we're in the same building across different floors? Oh, Slow this down a little bit. What if, uh, what if we're one building here and we're in the building next door? Okay. What if you guys, uh, what if I work with the team and uh, one team is here and we're in Sterling, Virginia? Okay. The other team is there in Herndon, Virginia. Is that okay? Herndon and Sterling doesn't seem that far, does it? Tell you what, depends on time of day, it can be a huge hassle. Mm -hmm. What if your team's in Arlington, Virginia? Okay. What if that team's in Pentagon Road, right? We're by the Navy Yard. Alexandria. 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 
<laughs> that's a trend. That's a transaction cost start adding up, right? Even as a developer, any developers in the room? Okay. If I'm working on two different projects, the act of tearing down, uh, the act of closing out one environment to bring up another one, right? I haven't developed code in a few years, but back in my day, back when I was a kid, sometimes that thing can be five, 10, 20 minutes just to bring up another environment. Okay. That's transaction costs. This kid's costly. That can be tough. We'll talk a bit. We'll talk a bit about that. Now, you had mentioned that what if we're better things? What if I had one team of elbows, one team of numbers, one team of songs? Can we optimize around that? Yeah. Would that be better? I, boring. <coughs> boring. I, I think there's a lot to be said for that, but there's things you're going to watch out if you do that. A lot of that depends what you're building, right? Because here's here's the things you watch out for. If you do that, let's say I had elbows, numbers, songs, right? And those are my three products, and you do it that way, I do a third of my work fourth of each, that works great if I sell it in equal volume. Okay? But if I don't sell in equal volume, it gets me a, a bit of a problem, right? What if I sell three elbows for every one number for every one song? What do I do then? How do I address that? Or what if people buy them different? What if people only buy them in packages? What if people want to buy them in groups of three elbows, one number, two songs? But also, that, that kind of uh, ratio changes seasonally. What do we do about that? If we have a situation like that, what's the best way to, well, I said best again, didn't I? That's, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> like, uh, what's an effective way to kind of address that? Well, well, there is a best way there because it's JIT inventory. So you uh, wouldn't start until you had an order. Yeah. You know what? It's, it's funny. I, I, I'm a strong believer in JIT inventory, but I was just today, literally today, reading about the, the problems that the Whole Foods has right now. And that's uh, a golf parking lot. That. Um, let me go back to the team structure on this one, though, right? Think about this. If all three of those together form the value product, right? Then what's the ideal way to? What would we want to do the teams in terms of trying to leverage this? Understanding that's how we do the value. Proportional team size. Well, if, 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 here's the deal. If my teams can deliver value on their own themselves, what we know for a fact is this. Dependencies slow you down and increase risk. Probably in your environment, you probably can't get rid of all your dependencies. The more dependencies you have, the slower you are, the riskier it is. Right? If I can structure teams in a way that deliver value, right? Kind of minimize dependencies, it's just faster. We'll talk a lot about this concept. So we'll, we'll get into a lot of these ideas uh, in this talk. Any other observations or thoughts before I jump in? Yeah. Um. We kind of forgot, like after we did the, for the, we went and did the elbows and we did the song and we did the numbers. And then we had to go back to the, the first time going back. Oh my God, how, how was the combination? And then it just took time to like remember what it was that we were doing. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember that. So we have data and it shows the cost of context switching and it's not linear. And if you get more than like one or two items, it gets really expensive as well, right? And so that mm -hmm. is very tough. Very tough. Let's see here. Do I have this in? Oh, there we go. There's actually a lot of people <coughs> that have gone into how a human brain functions too. And so a lot of people think that they can multitask, but really the human brain internally is serializing everything. And so I would say this. I would say this, and that uh, from a kind of a, a I would propose this. If I start one thing at once, well, let me ask you this. Let me change. Let me rephrase this. What happens if I start ten things at once? What happens to my ability to get ten things done compared to starting one thing and getting that done? Right. All other things being equal, uh, it's certainly be a lot faster to get one thing done than ten things. But I'll, I'll, we'll talk. We'll actually talk uh, great depth about that in just a moment. This one's not working, so we can just go off. Okay. I'm just curious, because um, I, I no, Rich. I'm, oh, Rich, look at you for a <laughs> um, Thanks. Uh, so, Richard, great yes. names. Um, so, I, I do um, dig what his, his he's going for there. Having said that, I, I think I've got my minor ADD. Yeah. But what I find is that because so what I find is I can't concentrate on something if something else comes in, and so what I end up doing is I shift, right? So it's like multi-threading. So I shift. 
write it down and get it out of my head so it's off my head, right? I don't actually try to focus on that forever yeah. and then come back. Yeah. So is that, can we also incorporate that into the You know what, that's actually a good idea in that it's fun to have idea to have some product line items. I suffer the same thing. Uh, so the product line item here is, what's my note here? Oh, you know what? I think I have in my bag. <coughs> Almost positive I have post-it notes in here. So I think that is a good practical line item. And so uh, here's what we'll do. They're not post-it notes, but I have index cards. What I will do is this. If at any point we have items like that that you think of, that uh, we want to do for parking lot, <coughs> just write it down on an index card, and we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll do that as the Q, as part of the Q and A at the end. Some of it. Oh, by the way, feel free to bring questions up real time. You're not forced to do this, but if you know there's a question you want us to address, but not necessarily in the moment, uh, just write it down on the, uh, the index card so you remember, and we can do a safety pack for that as well. But don't hesitate to bring up questions real time as well. Uh, let me introduce myself real quick. Well, let me just say that it's my Twitter handle. Um, work for Excel Consulting. I do a lot of agile training and coaching, and a lot of my background is federal, commercial, as well as nonprofit and association work. Um, I, I spent many years at the NASDAQ stock market. You guys familiar with NASDAQ? I spent several years at the Motley Fool. You guys heard of the Motley Fool? Mm -hmm. Fool.com's website. They are by far and away the best agile shop I've ever worked at. They do uh, really well. Uh, great place. Their game room is better than half the sports bars. Can. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent many years on site at the federal government. Uh, I was actually on site at OPM for many years. Uh, and I've done work with uh, the Census, CFPB, um, uh, DOD. Uh, OPM is uh, one I'm really most intimate with as well. Um, and so, uh, who here works with or for the federal government? Raise your hand. Who here kind of works for a commercial type company? Who works for nonprofit or association? So there are some nuanced differences across all that. There's also a lot of similarities too. Here's my information. Oh, uh, two quick promo slides, and I'll shut up about it. Uh, come take my training. Well, Jim here is a trainer as well, so you can take his too. Um, I do want to highlight one thing that I think is awesome, though. Yeah, the rest of these are awesome. You should memorize this. Take a picture. But the very first one, um, and actually, this is kind of a selfish, a uh, selfless plug. This. I'm not teaching it, I'm not getting, I'm not. This is a friend of mine, Kareem Harbutt, he's a uh, trainer out of the UK. Uh, I uh, used to teaching a certified large scale scrum course in um, Arlington uh, later this month. Uh, I took his class, it's very good, he's British, has a nice British accent, so he sounds smart. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm a big fan of a lot of the concepts there, I like that one a lot. That's all I'll say. All right, so, um, to go back to kind of what we were just doing here with the uh, with the, the last exercise, there's a oh that's the Tuckman model I referenced earlier. Um, so here's the here's the thing: why do companies do this? Why do companies spread people across multiple teams? And why do we, why do they do it? Poor planning, knowledge, knowledge, micromanagement, poor planning, lack of resources, lack of resources. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal with that, is that management, well here, here's, a, I mean all of you have really good points, um, and especially that lack of resources point, because here, here's really what happens, right? Let's say each one of these dots right here represents some project, some initiative, right? Each one of these dots represents some kind of project, some kind of initiative that we're trying to do, right? And what happens is, in our organizations, it's just a lot of volume. And it can be very stressful, overwhelming, but we gotta do it, they're all high priority, it's all gotta be done. Right. What's your name? James. Okay. So I just have a Jim, Jim and James, so. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another one over there somewhere too? Um, we have all these efforts, right? But what James said is a very good point, is look, you don't have infinite num money, you don't have infinite people, right? And so what happens is I have a finite number of folks. I have a finite number of <coughs> amount of money to do this. Thank 
these aren't people. So then how do we deal with all this if my number, if I you know, finite resources, finite number of people, so how do I do this? So the trap we see, uh, or the pattern we see a lot of organizations fall into is this. This person right here, you know what, you know, you know uh, front end, you know this, that. Why don't you spend 25%, 25%, 50%. Right? And why don't you work with uh, James over here, uh, you go 25%, we'll do you 25%, uh, 25%, 50% uh, uh, here. Uh, you go 33%, uh, 33%, 33%. And what happens is you start playing this kind of like, it's almost like Tetris, right? Um, actually, when I was at the, the CFPB years ago, uh, I saw a big board like this where it was a very pretty picture. They had people mapped initiatives. It was very pretty, uh, but it was also very complex. And when you look at it, anytime I see anything complex, um, well, complexity usually equates to slowness. Right? And so we play this we do this thing where we start mapping people to efforts. Here's why we do this, right? Think about this. Let's say I'm leadership, I'm management. Let's say up here, I don't know, let's say this is 100 items, okay? There's 100 different initiatives in place. We know we have finite people. How are my stakeholders, customers, end users gonna feel if I tell them, look, guys, I know look, we only have so much money, so many people, but out of the 100, I can get 60 of you guys started today, right? What's my, what are my stakeholders gonna say to me? How are they gonna feel initially? Individually, just fine. Yeah, they're gonna say, you know what, IT? Thank you very much, IT. You know, we know you only have so much money, we know you only have so many people, but we appreciate the fact that you can start all six of these. You're doing an amazing job, doing more with less, and taking an extra mile. We're really trying to figure it out. We appreciate that, okay? That's the initial response. So what you have here is the this appeasement, right? So as management, as leadership, as organization, it makes the system easier, right? But here's the problem with this. What happens? What's going to happen in this in this model? You're no, it's never going to be so yeah. Work, Working in parallel just means that you're doing all this stuff at the same time. You're not finishing anything. <clears throat> yeah, and so that's the problem. So that's you know, one of the things uh, that we talk a lot about, uh, talk a lot about in our CSM and, and CSPO type courses, is is a lot of uh, organizations, teams, and individuals are very good about getting things started. Right, this thing's seventy five percent done. This thing's twenty percent done. This thing's nine percent done. But getting started, that's not the point. Right? Getting started is nonsense. Right? What's the real point? What should the focus be? Getting things done, right? So here's here's what I recommend. And there's different models to do this. Um, but I'll show you what we did. I used to work with the NASDAQ stock market. And uh, when I was there, so I was there in the um, mid to late 90s to the early 2000s, about 97, 2004, uh, as an employee. And one of the changes, you know, I never worked for NASDAQ. <coughs> nice. What did you do? I'm sorry, when were you there? It was 2002, 2004, right when Rockville came in, actually. Okay, so you were there towards the end of Rockville. Yeah, yeah. I was in Rockville, too. The TCD. I, I, I didn't realize, I didn't, that's the first time I've seen that you work there, so I, I was curious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did a lot of website properties. Well, we can probably shouldn't spend the next two hours catching up. That's it. <laughs> um, so, uh, when I was there in the 90s, we kind of made the, this, the, this change, and it had a very marked effect. Here's a change. Basically, rather than kind of like playing catch with our folks, what we did is we said, you know what? It's risky to rely on individuals, right? And so what we did instead is we formed kind of more stable state teams. Right? And then we took all this inventory stuff, and there's what I'm about to show you next, there's different ways to kind of uh, do this. I'll show you the very simple way, is we just kind of this, you know, grouped them like this. Now then, here's what we do. From a Scrum standpoint, the way Scrum would do it is you would have, what would you have in Scrum that would kind of help bring in all this noise to prioritize it? Well, what's the role in Scrum, I should say? The product owner with the product owner. So we can accept that as a correct answer. So you'd have the product owner along with the product backlog right here. What they would do is they bring this in. Actually, I like the product backlog answer a lot the more I think about it, because that's really what we're going with this. What they would do is take all this noise, take all this inventory, and what they would do is they would uh, order it in a way so that we're delivering some stuff now, some stuff later. Now, here's why this is very hard and tricky. Out of these 100 people, you know how many things I'm gonna start at once? Uh, as little as possible, right? Now, here's the problem. So let's say there's three. You know, if I start at three out of 100, you know what 97 people are gonna do? <coughs> Yell at me, right? But here's the thing, effective leadership, effective um, 
product ownership. And it's not about appeasement. It's not about the illusion of progress. It's not about making people happy. You know what it's really about. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it, right? And so what happens, if you take a product owner type course, this is one of the key messages you get here in a course like that, is look, getting started is nonsense, or it's nonsensical, right? What matters is what gets done, right? And so what happens here is you have this complete inventory. And what happens here is, look, out of this complete inventory, we're gonna find the most valuable nuggets, finish those first. Then you're the next one, then the next one, then the next one. So let's say this person right here says, you're never doing mine. Okay, well here's the deal, I'm not playing favorites, right? What, what, what happens is, I'm not doing yours, it's not that yours isn't valuable, it's that there's stuff more valuable, right? And as an organization, it's not about making everyone happy per se, it's about delivering value. And so if this person right here needs, wants to be escalated further, what they really have to be able to do is present a greater value statement to explain why we should be getting them sooner. Because we don't have infinite time with the people. So that's the concept there in terms of restructuring away from this kind of uh, uh, illusion of progress, this appeasement model, into more of a delivery model. Any questions so far? Stuff like this, by the way, doesn't happen overnight. But stuff like this has got to be made transparent to uh, to those uh, that can make that can affect this, because what I see right now in some places is just where you have team members spread across multiple teams, or where there's constant shifting priorities where nothing gets done. Now, um, one note about this: there's actually a couple ways to do this. This one right here turns out to be one of kind of the uh, more straightforward ways to do this. There's a few other approaches too that uh, that you, know, you also want. I like this as a first step because we get from. Um, the illusion of progress is actual delivery, right? But we actually have, there, there is a little nuanced problem with this. If you think about this, right, the nuanced problem revolves around prioritization and the throughput. Anyone catching what the nuanced problem is here? Who determines priority? Well, now, uh, that's part of it. That'd be part of it. That's because of the vision yeah. scope, or vision roadmap, and that's, I think that's part of it. But something more mechanical, a little more. I have soft skill set that are going into each team. I'm sorry? I have soft skill sets that are going into each team. Don't worry about that for now. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll that. There. Size of a project? Uh, well, now from a scrum standpoint, we, we'll, we'll talk about that too. From a scrum, scrum standpoint, oh, by the way, anyone here a certified scrum master? Mm -hmm. So, what's the ideal scrum team size? Depends who you're talking about. The latest team teams are. Uh, yeah. So latest issues are about the three to nine range. Well, the latest. But the, sorry, not, not to be a stickler because yes, I am. I'm not a CSM, but I am. Take certain. one of our courses. No, I don't want the CSM. No, you should take it. It's awesome. It's okay. Uh, no, the, latest of the, uh, the, the latest condition of the the Scrum Guide just says that it's uh, small enough to be nimble but large enough to have the uh, knowledge necessary to finish the back. Yeah, I think those are great points. And there used to be a uh, saying past, but anyone heard the uh, what was it two pizzas? Yeah, yeah. 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 two pizzas. Yeah. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Guess guess you can eat one pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but there, but I think the whole what we're getting to is good. Anything too big, what happens is it's not, you can't start to cohesive as a team. I'll show you some scale models. I'll show you some. Uh, I'll show you some models in a bit. I, I like that you cringed at that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's the point here, though, right? The, the, one of the things I, get, I think all of you brought up really good points, but here's the danger. Imagine this. What if this? Uh, what if uh, everything here was more important than the rest of this combined? Right. Now it's a bit of a problem because they're going out in the same. So based on your segmentation, right? If we segment it pure like this. The problem is that this portfolio here may be vastly, there may be elements like here that may be more important here, and but the problem is the throughput the way this is set up uh, wouldn't reflect necessarily what we're always working on is most valuable. So there is a tweak you can make to this, but it's kind of a dangerous tweak, which is this. Some kind of portfolio, portfolio alignment layer. Right? So we're coming here, some sort of portfolio alignment layer. I think it makes a lot of sense, but here's what I would say. If you're transitioning something that's very matrix into this, I would say it's work on kind of getting throughput. The portfolio alignment layer, the problem I've seen here, actually before I start, I saw a hand up. Well, I was just gonna say, um, to me, what just in a fundamental concept is, I think you would have to revisit those top three, almost like you would any, any other backlog, where yeah. it's a living 
breathing. Yeah. You know, so you're going to have, I mean, that's not just, you don't just set that up for a year and, let it and go. just yeah. let it go. I mean, I think somebody in the organization, and maybe it's this portfolio that, uh, level you're drawing is, you know, maybe you have someone that is looking at that every week. And so maybe you can make potentially some modifications along those. Mary, what's your name again? I'm sorry? What's your name? Jason. Jason. Yeah. So, uh, no, Jason brings a good point. And I would say this, implicit to everything I say is that whatever you do, period, should have strong, should have frequent feedback loops so that nothing I say is a state one time thing, right? I absolutely agree 100%, Jason, that if you were to set this up, what you would want to do is get create feedback loops so you can rebalance that. Even if you don't have this portfolio alignment layer, if you have it spread throughout, you want to have feedback loops to see if this is working for you and be able to make those adjustments at both the team capabilities uh, level and at the portfolio level, right? So I agree with that statement. Richard, why would you ever have those artificial partitions? Because both scaling models, both safe and less, mm -hmm. right, use a single backlog. Oh, I can't tell you what's going to be perfect. Now. I can tell you what we did in that no, second. No, yeah, yeah. But, but, what I'm, no, oh. but what I'm asking, just from a theory, yeah. you know, you're, you're describing oh. this. So conceptually, what I would do is, Wait a minute, I didn't finish my point. Yeah. Because if you have a single backlog, because the other thing you didn't mention was, was waiting, right, for your queuing. Yeah. So if, you, if you're looking for, the, you know, the weighted shortest job and then stacking in that order, in yeah. priority order, you can do it with a whole backlog, but how would you do it across yeah. you So you raised a really programs. good point. Here's the, uh, this is actually really good, but it's very dangerous, because here's why, right? Because what I've seen at several agencies is this, is that this works really well if it works really well, and it works well if we have a mature organization that's capable of quick turnaround decisions, right? This works amazingly well. I think you're, what you said it's very good. It works amazingly well, assuming this layer can, is effective, it can turn around decisions. The problem I have, I've seen, is that organization so chose transitioning, it gets stuck right here. Right? And once it gets stuck right here, what are these teams doing? They're making stuff up. I see this time and time and time again. The reason we do this, it's almost like a hack because it's a little more effective initially. I ultimately would rather have this layer if I could do it well, but this is hard to do well. What's effective shorter term is to be just going to do. So at NASDAQ, we did it this way, right? I had the website properties NASDAQ Trader, OTCMB, and QLX, NASDAQ.com, kind of. Those were my properties, right? And what we could do is prioritize it and really send it through, right? Um, ultimately, I would like to be here. I think this ultimately is better once I have effective turnaround time here. This has to be effective so teams aren't just working on nonsense. So would the product owner then only be, um, in theory, communicating mostly with the portfolio layer and not go, going bypassing por portfolio. I'll show you that. I'll okay. show you that, yeah. There's different models. As a matter of fact, I have a, my buddy Kareem who's going to be here. He texted me and said, look, don't be teaching that one product owner per team nonsense. Because um, the, the way uh, Les looks at it versus the, some of what I've seen uh, have a slight disagreement in areas. Both are valid. There's just pros and cons of both. And so we'll talk about your exact question in just a moment. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's the thing. So if you map initiatives to teams, right, uh, it's effective, simple, potentially less dependencies, right? But the cons is you're not maybe working on high priority things. Uh, if you do this portfolio management layer, uh, the pros is that, that you're really focused on maximizing delivery of value, right? And the cons are essentially the opposite of that, is that, is that the decision making, if not effective, leads to a lot of waste. I'm not saying one, well actually I am saying one thing or the other. If you do that portfolio one better, it's better. That's a big if statement. Does that help answer your question? So what? Yes. Okay. I'll go with that. I'm going to be more of a C plus B minus type guy. <laughs> um, oh, so someone I mentioned earlier, the concept of, well, what if my team members get bored on the team? What if they don't like it anymore? Okay. So um, back in the, uh, remember when things were good? When everyone was a millionaire making tons of money in IT, this, that, and the other? So, conceptually. So back in the day when things, and actually it's still kind of like this in the West Coast. So back in the day when things were really good, it was considered rude to complain about your job. No one, oh, you guys didn't need that. Uh, it was considered rude to complain about your job, right? And so if you didn't like your job, like, you know what you, you don't complain, what would you do? Find a new job. Just get a new job, right? And so what happened was, Apple, Google, Microsoft, right? And so what would happen is people from Apple would leave go to Google. People from Google would go to Microsoft, vice versa, right? 
And so what happened was people would leave and when they would take their knowledge, their practices, their experience with them. And so if I'm at Apple and went to Microsoft, I say, hey, how are you guys doing your automated testing here? That's some 1990s nonsense. No one does like that anymore. Here's how we did it. And what happened is you'd have this massive share, right? And you saw this really rapid escalation of capabilities once we had that. And so what we did at the Motley Fool, uh, so I was at the Motley Fool, we implemented the exact same idea. What we did is we did we encouraged rotations. At any point, if anyone wanted to, they could change teams, right? Now the key is we don't want to lose critical mass in a team. Right? But let's say this person's like, oh, look, I've been on this team for a year and a half, I'm bored, I want to go over here. Okay, let's do that. And what happened is we get these people coming in and out, and what we saw from there was really a great sharing of understanding of uh, practices, of, uh, of uh, capabilities, and just a great, more diversity in thought. Because what we're doing is uh, uh, things that we, teams are doing better, we would naturally share. right? And then these folks would also go back to their old teams and say, hey, guys, I'm on this new team now, we've been doing it really bad this and this way, here's what they're doing. And you have this rapid escalation of ideas. We thought that was a great way to kind of organically create that, um, uh, that, uh, that uh, learning, right? And so it was called the Silicon Valley effect. Uh, but we experimented that finally, for, uh, we saw a great, uh, great amount of uh, learnings from that. Uh, I'm gonna show you something. So one of my clients is OPM, and they have a uh, product called USA Staffing. So is anyone here familiar with USA Staffing? USA Staffing is a product that OPM sells to other agencies to um, allow them to interface with the federal HR system. So USA Staffing, it's not one team. It's like five or six teams. Right? So the way they have it set up is as follows. At the very top, At the very top, what they have is what they call a super product owner. And the super product owner is kind of overseeing the entire USA staffing kind of a program. Right? But like I said, it's not uh, one team, it's like five or six teams. And so what they have here. Is what USA Staffing does is uh, they have uh, this folks, this group of people right here, work together as kind of the product ownership team. Right? They work together as the product ownership team, making sure that the uh, the products always align uh, overall. But then what happens is uh, here, what these folks have, these are the sprout teams. <coughs> These are the scrum teams. So what happens here is if I'm a, uh, let's have a developer right here, who am I talking to in terms of my uh, kind of uh, uh, release plans, roadmap, vision, all that? The Who's product. kind of the product owner here? But what we have here is these group kind of uh, uh, creating focus, making sure the entire program is being kind of uh, addressed, right? So they work together. Now, one of the critical parts that really kind of makes this effective, I think, well, Here's what we see here. Is if you notice the way these teams are structured, by the way, if you're really paying attention, some of these teams are probably a little too big. Talk to them about that. Um, but I'll tell you what, when I started with OPM in 2010, 2009 versus where they are today, it's like they were just talking about that. It's uh, uh, where they are today versus 2010, ninth day. The way this is structured right now is this. The teams are uh, structured in a way to try to deliver value uh, like this. The way it's segmented is so they can minimize the amount of dependency across teams. What I want to, what they're trying to avoid, they're trying to avoid is this. I don't want that. Meaning, I don't want um, requirements team, design team, development team, testing, release team. Right? It's a very waterfallish approach. We don't want that. 
but I also don't want, because I don't want the back-end team, front-end team, middleware team, integration team, release team, I don't want that either. It's an architectural waterfall. Why would I not want that? What's the danger? What's the risk? We toss your things over the wall. I think there's all that. I mean, there's way to toss things over the wall. But also, I was a math major in college, Virginia Tech. Um, as a pure mathematic equation, we start seeing problems, right? Think about this. So, um, version one, you guys familiar with version one? They have a website, State of the Agile. Uh, I think on their website, it says something along the lines, I might be a bit off here, but it says something along the lines that Agile teams have a 75% chance of, su of success. I don't know, maybe I'm making that up, but I think it's on there. Agile teams have a 75% chance of success. Okay. That means each team individually has a 75% chance of success. Okay. It's pretty good, actually. Right. Now, here's the problem as a pure mathematical equation. Right. If I need all five teams to succeed together to deliver product, right. anyone know how to do the math? It's multiplication. Yeah, it's multiplication, right? It's 0.75 times 0.75 times 0.75 times it's 0.75 to the fifth power across five teams. Right. If you actually do the math, I think it ends up being um, small. Degree, 0.7%. So here's the deal. You can't get rid of all your dependencies probably. You probably can't get rid of all your dependencies. But the more dependencies you have, the more it slows you down, the more it increases risk. So in a situation like this, what happens is just the ability, the mathematical probability of success alone based on the data is just exponentially smaller. It's not that it's going to guarantee the fail, but your chances of success are much less, your chances of failure are much higher. <clears throat> so, I have a question that's going to me. Um, so, given the, the internet, at least, um, so I'm, I'm working on a project right now where we basically effectively have, from a user perspective, one product, yeah. but we use microservices and APIs, so we have a bunch of smaller products. Okay. Like, how does that tweak your statement about front end? I mean, we're, we're building a ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I see that. Here's the yeah. thing, though, right? Is that when I, had, when I was at the Better Vehicle Association, our, uh, we were, I was on a middleware team, right? But we were, we were selling middleware. So our product was middleware to the DMVs to communicate back and forth. The thing is, if you're building an ecosystem where you have front end teams, back end teams, here's the fact, right? Maybe you have to for whatever reason, but the fact matter is they have to integrate, <coughs> both parts have to work for you to deliver anything. That's just a statement of fact. Yeah. The chance of happening, though not, not you no, know, it doesn't guarantee failure. But what it is, it's just harder. Right? So what you have is you have a system set up that's inherently more difficult. Right? Um, I'm not saying which so, is good or bad, but, but it's have, hard. We have both. Yeah. We have cross cutting front end that looks across the entire thing, yeah. and you know they're responsible for standards yeah. and and cross cutting work. And then we have the. I'm not saying what you're doing is, is good or bad. But what you have to realize is in what you're doing, there are certain things that are set up that you may want to rethink. Right? I mean, but we're doing enterprise UX. And enterprise UX... Is it working well for you? It's getting there. Don't change it. Is it not working well for you? It was really horrible there in the beginning. <laughs> in my mind, we don't have enough people looking across right. and understanding that this is an ecosystem and this isn't nine pet projects. But... Um, you, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm not here to but, kind of re-architect. Yeah, yeah. I don't want. Yeah. I'm not saying we're doing this bad law. I don't want to yeah, get no, that. No. Get, get that across. We're doing both. Yeah. But what I would say is that there is some dangerous traps you might be falling into, right? Um, in that, that you could see, you know, what I don't want is I don't want this ivory tower person to come in and say it has to be done this way. But what happens is because of the integration points, because you have component-based teams, that now what you have are these painful integrations that may may not work, and it's rolling dice. Maybe you hit a seven. Maybe you hit a two. Right? <clears throat> It's just something that inherently the system you have in place is going to be very tricky to work with. If I like the microservice, I like the APIs, right? But if you can somehow kind of reduce, if you look at this picture, what I have here is I haven't gotten rid of, we haven't gotten rid of all the dependencies, right? We still have kind of a centralized 508. We kind of have this a centralized security aspect to it, right? But what we have done is this. See these testing elements here? They're not doing testing for anyone. You know who does testing? each individual team. But you'll notice there's no testers on these teams, right? If there's no testers on team, who's doing testing? Developers. We call her. The only people, the testing personnel here, we're creating test infrastructure. 
So there's some dependency because we rely on test infrastructure, but that test thing is still handled within our, our components. We can't, I'm not saying you can necessarily get rid of all your dependencies, but what I want you to come away with is that your dependencies slow you down and increase risk, right? And you have to be able to balance that risk and that slowness with what you're trying to achieve. Um, the other danger I see is this. In organizations that are very kind of aligned to their technology and technology platforms where you have CIO, CTO type people running the organization, right? It tends to fall to a pattern where I do more component-based build-outs, right? That's the general pattern. When I have companies that are very product and customer focused, it tends to be, right, the pattern is that we see teams that are really focused on value stream build-outs. There's a few tweaks to that, but those are some of the patterns that we typically see. Question? Yeah, so without getting off on too much of a tangent, when I, when I see this, uh, my first question actually before you mentioned it was, I actually, my role before I started working in, as a Scrum Master was originally BA and then moving towards more of a BA tester hybrid because that's kind of where we're at now, I think. So when I, um, when I see this model, um, I, I, I my, my question basically is, I've seen organizations where uh, very similar to this, where for, for whatever reason, and maybe you said because of infrastructure, testing is broken out into a separate, whatever you would call those bullets on the left. Yeah. Okay, so what, what this means then, though, is if you have if you have high-level management that is not necessarily bought into this uh, matrix here, I've seen where we have, we are required, where you have um, let's say test status or, or whatever you would call it yeah. going up through the Endeavor, Galactica, and, and yeah. Infinity. And then you also, you have these poor testers that are then re uh, reporting up the chain to the test managers that are in that left side. Yeah. So, so now we have we have analyst testers that are basically telling one thing to the, to the scrum masters and to each of these five. What, and, and that whole is, so the, the, the very simple thing at the grassroots level is you know we know the handoff from development testing right that back and forth right it's just slower less effective right we know that um, so we will, don't do that but uh, at a higher level though I think a lot of what you preface it with would show inherent issues that need to be addressed a lot of it's like management's not aligned with this right if, if we're going to do agile process what I'd like to have is our leadership our management try to understand some of the effects we want to get from it and be able to kind of it create a think that uh, focuses heavily on delivery value versus a think that focuses heavily on compliance across uh, yeah. some kind of uh, 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 false measures. Because so that would be deeper conversation. Yeah, because it becomes a conflict of interest because you have you know people on the left that are involved with a different type of status than what's actually going to channel out through the project. So now uh, back to kind of uh, what you guys are saying over here, real quick. I would say this. I like this a lot. Uh, I was just talking to a less trainer. So less. Uh, what I'm showing here is actually not. 100% line with less. Less probably takes a closer view to you um, uh, in terms of big complex systems, and and so uh, they less actually does not promote the concept of uh, this kind of product ownership. They believe in area product ownership, and they do for other things. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I think some of their logic points are good, and I think it's good to understand these perspectives. I will say this: the teams I've worked with and coached with, I, I think this model's worked out really well. Right, and and basically what happens is. I want to decomplex certain systems. You know, I, I cringe at scaling. There's reasons why I do that. Part is decomplexing overly complex systems. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm with you on that. That's why I say, like, you know, for, for our project anyway, yeah. but, like, we only have the one dot com. Yeah. Everything else is sort of its own product, yeah. right? And, and, I, and I just, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say so you guys are bad or wrong. It'd be awesome, yeah. actually. Yeah. I have to go and rate it. We're actually, we're doing something, really I mean, cool. in general, we're doing something really hard. Yeah. yeah. We are taking 10 websites that are mission websites that, like like literally a trillion dollars of federal spending goes through every year. So these are serious websites that cannot be down at all. And we are doing, we are breaking all 10 of them apart like Lego blocks and putting them back together completely different. Like we're changing an engine mid-flight and trying to land safely kind of project. And so it's, it, it takes a certain That's amount fun. of well, what I'm happy about is you guys are taking an agile approach because uh, <laughs> right? a, a waterfall, big bang approach would be rolling dice and hoping you get uh, a, a five and a six, right? Because uh, uh, so that that's great. Uh, and, then, and so yeah, you know. and, and we're building in a separate environment and rolling it out in beta and getting it tested before you know before flipping the switch and okay. and and being smart that way. But but it, it takes a certain amount of adapting these practices. Yeah, I want to show you some basic ideas. In all your environments, by the way, all your environments are going to be a little bit different because, 
right? We're a bit different because we're a small startup. We're a bit different because we're heavy mission critical. We're a bit different because we're the financial industry. We're a bit different because we're medical. It's a pacemaker. Everyone's a bit different because of something. I want to give you some base ideas. And, uh, and it's a really fundamental difference between training and coaching. Uh, and in a training environment, you give you base ideas. A coaching environment, they really get into your butts. I mean, so uh, into your uh, nuances. <laughs> um, quick note here. Um, so part of the question is, hey, so in this environment, what happens to my managers? What if I'm like the director of uh, development? What if I'm in charge of all the testers? What if I'm in charge of all the analysts? What if I'm head of all the scrum masters? What happens to me? So the functional manager, right? Who here's a tester? Raise your hand. Who here's a developer? Raise your hand. Who here's an analyst? Raise your hand. Well, from Scrum standpoint, you all be developers, right? Uh, but from that standpoint, you have bosses, right? And oftentimes, what happens? Your bosses are in this blue rectangle, right? But your Scrum teams are in this white rectangle, right? So the, what I've seen work really well is this: in a picture like this, who, uh, what does, what determines what you do day to day? The blue or the white? Right. So what happens around like this, day to day, you know, as a team, I identify with the, the white rectangle. That's my team, right? But what happens, the blue, I, I love the concept, and I thought they did this really well at the Motley Fool of communities of practice, right? And so what happens at the Motley like I was part of the Scrum Master Community of Practice, right? So we had this guy, he was uh, in charge of all of us. Um, and what happens here is if you're in the blue, if you're like the functional manager of this, here's what you're in charge of in charge of. The white is how you do business, right? But the blue is my craft. It's our, it's our, and so what happens there in the blue, a lot of it's professional development, right? So if I'm your function manager, it's about uh, you growing as a professional. You did, as a developer, you'd be understanding, you know, where you are today, uh, growing your capabilities, training plan, going to conferences, events. What I would do is organize lunch and learns, um, pairing opportunities. Um, and so at the blue level, it's about growing the craft and growing the community, right? Having all my developers be able to kind of understand each other. And so we did a lot of lunch and learns. Here's the other thing at Motley Fool. So I was part of the Scrum Master community practice. Here's what we did at the Motley Fool. So when I was there, we had like uh, six Scrum teams when I was there. This is a few, several years ago. We had six Scrum teams. So the way this worked was that um, um, Scrum Master community practice, we created what we called Scrum uh, norms. Right. So every so basic concept is look, hey, if you're at the Motley Fool, don't reinvent the wheel. Right. If you do scrum the Motley Fool, here's the scrum norms. But every team is allowed to have their own scrum pilots, right? And so that means a deviation from the norm. And so what the uh, Scrum Master Community Practice did is we periodically review all the pilots, right? And the pilots that we liked a lot, we'd incorporate as a new norm. Some pilots we thought were fine, but we wouldn't force everyone to do it. And so these pilots are optional. Any team that wants to adopt it can. You don't have to. It's a, uh, an optional pilot, uh, an optional norm. And then some pilots realize, whoa, this is really, this isn't how we want to do it here. What you're doing, like someone suggested a velocity per person, like that is an awful idea. Get out of my office. Right? We, we don't have offices. But uh, some ideas we would say, you know what, uh, we don't like this. Here's what we don't like about it. Let's not do this anymore. Right? So what we did here is created kind of like. Some consistency. So we did it with the Scrum Master Group. Developers did it with their coding standards. One of the coolest things was we had a UI UX community practice. They created the Motley Fool grid system, right? The, the grassroots at the uh, horizontal level. What was great about that is before that, the uh, creatives there were kind of different shapes and sizes, and sometimes it was hard to reuse creatives. But once you created a grid system, what happened was a lot of the components created by different teams became a lot more kind of uh, interchangeable and reusable, and uh, and it was it was good. And so that's a lot of what we see here with our communities. Oh, and the other thing we did do as well is we, we did form, we, um, yes, yeah, familiar with like kind of the, some of the Spotify videos. Mm -hmm. So we actually did something very similar. What we did in terms of our scaling, it wasn't less or safe or any of that. We just kind of, uh, it was homegrown. And what we did was um, we also had, uh, periodically we had team members from each team get together and to kind of make sure that we were all kind of um, a sync up in terms of various teams. Quick question on that, Richard. So uh, obviously with the teams, you can you have results that are measurable, right? Like how, whatever metrics you use, velocity, whatever. Um, but when you get into communities and practice, then now, now you have people 
you have individuals who have, let's just say, yearly objectives that they need to meet or whatever, you know. Yeah. So how how do you guys or how did they measure, let's just say, the success of Blue Squares or or? Oh, um, at the end of the day. You so know. I can tell you how I would do it. I can tell you. So a good buddy of mine actually ended up being um, uh, the uh, one of the uh, good buddy of mine. Actually, it's funny. This guy was a when when I inherited him as a twenty-something. Um, uh, new guy to the team, but he had brilliant ideas and eventually made his way up to a uh, uh, CIO secure leadership position. And he was kind of, he was kind of hardcore, and so uh, uh, he did uh, what, what, what. One of the things he put in place was the concept of, hey, who here, uh, who here, uh, the company survey, who here is performing above their job, who here is performing below their job, right? and so that's one of the things they did kind of across the board. I, I probably would, I, here's what I would do. What I would do is I would do a 360 at the team level. Uh, for each team, whatever team you're on, 360 at the team level. Scrum Master, Product Owner, Dev Team together do a 360. Here's why I love this idea. Because what's going to happen is if you do a 360 at the team level, we're all team, we're all going to agree to be cool. Right? So everyone be cool, everyone kind of give each other this type of score, we're all going to be cool. The, so with that kind of shared understanding, what's really going to stand out in that environment? If we do 360, we're all evaluating each other. We're all kind of agree that we're going to be cool, right? What's going to stand out the most? What are the only two tech people that can stand out in that environment? Very high and very low. The very best and very worst, right? Because we'll all say, look, we're all great, right? But we, what's your name? Anna. Anna. We know Anna's phenomenal. We all say, but Anna, you know, she's phenomenal. We know she's working way. So we'll call Anna out specifically, right? Or let's say I'm a complete trainer. It's like, look, we're all cool, but you know what? We don't, we don't want to rich my team anymore. It's just such a drag every time. And that I like that concept. Uh, there's, I am not an HR appraisal type expert, so those are some things I've seen, uh, but um, not my area expertise. But that's that's. Um, with that said, that's what, that's what I like. Um, any questions so far? How are we leaving on time? How much time do I have? I saw that I have till midnight, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can go as far as eight thirty, but usually we start switch to Q and A at okay. eight. Oh, so what happens to project managers? Who are any project managers in the room? Where's project managers fit in the scrum? No, outside. <laughs> Nowhere, right? It's outside of that. Yeah, so, so what happens What happens in your projects today? Well, what's your, um, so, uh, if you take a scrum master step, if you take a course, right? Based, one of the fundamental things is from a kind of a, just a general philosophical approach, is that we've, um, uh, from a scrum standpoint, we view it philosophically different. It's, it's not about a sequencing of activities. It's not about like a, you know work breakdown structure. It's more about a, it's more product management, right? It's more about the breakdown of, of value, right? Trying to identify what's the most important things to the next, to the next. CSM type course will cover that, but I will show you this. So if the question is where does a project manager go, I don't know if I have a great answer, but I can tell you what I've seen in some government agencies that worked relatively well. I don't know if I have the best answer, but I'll tell you what I've seen. It worked relatively well. So this is what we did at OPM. So here's the Scrum team. Okay. Product owner, Scrum master, dev team members. So what I have is I have a PMO. I think it was Booz or Century. I think it was Booz. Pretty sure it was Booz. So what we have is a project manager slash PMO here. Okay. Now one thing was they didn't love with the team. They didn't love the team. But what we had in government, we had all this other stuff. We had stuff like EVM, contracting, OMB, <coughs> GAO, other acronyms. And so what actually worked really well, the guys I work with, the, the folks I work with, they were pretty good. And uh, what we did is we would meet with them. And they would take a lot of like the type of information and data we were collecting. And what they would do is they basically take our information and then kind of like uh, deal with this stuff. Right? They would just deal with this stuff. And so here's what I like about it: what it did is remove burden from the team. Right? And so if you have product managers, now they're not doing stuff for us, right? They're not like going to be a helicopter parent doing things for us. What they are doing though is they are removing the burden. If you're working with product managers and PMOs, what you have is this. If you have an entity there that's removing the burden so I can execute better, I think that's fantastic. But if they're increasing to the burden or increasing the amount of friction to delivery, I think that's not fantastic. Right? 
What they also did is we have multiple initiatives going on, and they help kind of cohese some of the, uh, the data uh, across other teams too, right? So they did that as well. I thought that was fine. Now, a couple important notes about this is that this is the, let's say this is the business. It should not be a go-between. Right? What we have right here is these, we're working directly with the business, nor should they be a go-between in terms of how we work together across our teams. Right? So this was more direct line of path. But uh, this stuff up here, they were uh, helpful. At least, so that's the experience that I've had. I found it helpful. And, that, and that's, uh, was the, what was the communication channel coming from, let's just say, the PMO to the teams? Was it through the product owner or through the scrum master? So um, what happened there is uh, we had usually, uh, there was a meeting, and so uh, we had a couple of them come down to uh, where we were. We meet with them. And usually in the room was like the product owner, the scrum master, usually developer and analyst. Right? So it really, a lot of it depended on kind of what the focus were during that, because uh, there's peaks and valleys where a lot of it's going to be more product focused, a lot of it's going to be more technical focused. The scrum masters there just kind of basically help uh, kind of coach. So the idea of in this question was budget, right? So like if, if you if there are budget issues, so that need to be discussed between either PM and PMO, and then somebody on the team to kind of say, okay, we, we thought we had eight sprints, now we got four because we just got half the money. So that that would be the type of question. Yeah, that something like that would be more of a, a product kind of thing. Okay, yeah, something like that would typically be more of a product kind of thing. So that's typically the way I do. All right. Uh, oh, I mentioned dependencies earlier, and so I kind of talked about this. One of the things I did with the DoD, so I was working with the, the this was a, a DoD, so we actually had a, a sit down with them, and what we did is, um, so I was working with a group, and uh, the concept was, look, we had a lot of, this was the leadership team, the concept was we had a lot of dependencies that were just killing us, right? And so what we did is we uh, sat down, this was a division with the Department of Defense, and what we did is we had all the leaders from that division come in, and their homework coming in was to identify the key initiatives they're working on. And so what we did is each one of these columns represents uh, uh, one of the leaders. So each, each leader had a column. Okay. So it was their group. Uh, this very top row, this was, um, so this was uh, early in the year, so this is Q1, all things inflate. Q2, Q3, Q4, and FY16. Okay. And so what they did is they posted up a lot of their key uh, initiatives they're working on, right? And so then what they did is they used a string. What do you think the string represents? Uh, uh, yes. yes. Uh, probably gave that away. Uh, the string represents dependencies. <laughs> what happens is, um, it's one thing to talk about dependencies, but once I can visualize them, I can more intelligently speak to them. Also, once I visualize them, we realize, oh, I had no idea you wanted that for me, right? I had no idea you need that for me now. And so it helps enable conversation. Once you have a conversation, one of the key things was, are there any dependencies we can decouple? Anything we can decouple right away is a big win. But you can't decouple all of them. This was the after picture. This is after decoupling. This is after decoupling. We still have to this. Then we have to have a conversation what we do about it. This is conversation. Uh, like I, I'm not going to lie to you. Not everything's fixed through conversation, but it's the first step. So what this was great, though, is you notice there's something here that goes to here. We got, is that okay? Is that okay? Part of it is going to depend which way it goes, right? Yeah. Because if these people need something from them, okay, well, that's not as bad because it's going to be built. Although I'll, I'll say this, you're going to build something and I'm going to use it 12 months from now, that's risky. Right. Now, if it's the other way around, if these people need something from them, well, then it's not going to work because I'm going to be ready now and you're saying you're not touching it for another 12 months. That's a huge problem. And so what it does is we have to have that conversation. Yeah, that's what this really does. And there, if you do this by the way, what I like about this is as a leadership team, before what they did was like whole status meetings, what we did now is we kept this up there. And what they do is as a leadership team, they would revisit their key initiatives according to what they have here. Yeah. And about once a quarter, they would revisit it uh, wholesale. Any questions so far? All right, I'm gonna end with this, is uh, concept of scaling. Number one, uh, I cringe earlier because um, if I have something that's big and complex, right, you know what I really like to do something that's big and complex? 
D scale. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned earlier I can eat a whole pizza, right? I lied, I can't, not today. I mean, I, a 20 year old version of me totally can. Uh, today there's no way, I, I, would, I would throw a half there. Um, but not really, I can actually, I can totally eat a whole pizza. You know how I would do it? One slice at a time at a time, right? But that's what we would do, I would decomplex the problem. And so, um, one of the fun issues I have a lot of these scaling models is that uh, I question the fact is, is this scale really what you need? But with that said, I'm gonna talk about a couple of them real quick. Um, oh, first of all, the very most important thing is this very first bullet point. If you can't execute using Kanban or Scrum, don't bother scaling. All you're gonna do is scale your failures. You have to be able to execute without the... I was about to clap, oh. actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh um, my God. If you cannot execute at the foundation level, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one on top, you can't execute. Okay. So that's the first thing, is, is be able to, um, to uh, be able to deliver at the team-based level, then we can start talking about other stuff. This is uh, SAFE, I'm SAFE certified. Uh, I don't love it. Uh, the re here's what, really in this, in this picture, the SAFE and the less are, are probably the two big things in conversation. I don't think SAFE is awful. Right? And, and I, I, I don't know Dean Levin well, well, but I've chatted with him here and there. And, and what they would say is this. I'm, well, here's my problem with SAFE. I feel like it's overly prescriptive. I feel like a lot of this isn't needed. What Levin well would say right, is he would say, look, it was never meant to, for you to do everything. What we're showing is a, a, a world of possibilities. Your job is to kind of take this and be able to trim out the elements you don't need, right? To keep the elements you want, right? And, and so the concept there is that you, 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 you kind of scale it back. That's what, the, that's what the premise is. That's what I think they would say. Uh, but here's the dangerous thing, especially in a town like Washington, D.C., is they don't do that. Right? <laughs> and what it, happens it is... Use the and so the danger is that it's just implemented like this, and, and for uh, most of your endeavors, it's, it's just too heavy. Yeah. The heft of it is going to be very tough for you. Right? So that's that's one. Of the, there's a, a couple other nuanced things I'm not a huge fan of, but that's a big thing. If you understand Agile really well and can apply it deftly, I don't think it's awful. <clears throat> but those are a couple of big caveats. That's not a really good review. I'm sorry? That's not a very positive review. I don't think it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, So this is less. There's actually a bigger picture of this, too. There's a one called Less Huge, which uh, it's kind of out. You can tell by a picture, it's just, it's just different. It, it's not trying to appeal to the, to the buyer market like this one is. Um, uh, I, I, so I'm, uh, I'm actually very friendly with the uh, Craig and Boss. We've had debates about a couple of points. Uh, my debates with them largely revolve around their aspect of product ownership and component teams. But with that aside, I actually like a lot, uh, it's not perfect either. But what I like about Less, it takes the exact opposite approach to safe. What it does, it gives you some real foundational concepts. And what it does, you start with foundational concepts and you add more layers on top uh, as you need them, right? It's less. Right, so, um, and I like that concept. I think it aligns really well with uh, with, with uh, Agile and Scrum. Okay. Like, so there's a few tweaks I, I would, if I were them, I, there's a few things I would, I would tweak, but I think it's actually a really good starting point. I, I like this one. Um, yeah. The rest of these, no, oh, there's a whole Spotify thing. It's actually not a model, it's just what they did. It's kind of homegrown. You can, uh, there are some really good videos about what Spotify has done, uh, but it's not really a model that's intended to be followed, per se, but a lot of their ideas are really good. A lot of the ideas, we actually came to the same endpoint model full organically as well. Um, if you if you Google, you can find some uh, some of the talks about what they did at Spotify. I think that the, the information it gives good. It's just not an actual model. Um, oh, so uh, uh, Mike Beadle has some enterprise Scrum concepts. Uh, I'm not as familiar with him except I am familiar with a lot of his business agility concepts. I love these business agility ideas. Uh, a lot of the scaling we talk about here is about the execution level. So it is business agility concept. He talks about just the, the ability to kind of come up with these, uh, initiate the business ideas and bring them to light. Um, the, it's, it's kind of becoming more and more things. So you can go to conferences and events and really and, and read more about those concepts. I like it because it's really the, uh, make sure we're building good, right, appropriate things. This one I'm not gonna speak to because I have no idea what this means, but uh, Scott Ambler uh, has a discipline agile delivery. I can't speak to it intelligently, so others know it's out there. Other than that, I don't know anything about it. Uh, same with this. 
this is Nexus. This is like some European something. This is a scrum.org thing. I'm not intimate with this at all, other than it's out there. So uh, that's it. If you are doing scrum across multiple teams, take less training. Uh, but with that said, uh, I, I like to be complex and big systems. Any questions about that? Um, would you say the, uh, for enterprise um, business agility, the person's name is? Oh, so Mike Beetle, he's one of the... Uh, Beetle as in the bug? Uh, no, Beetle as in the B-E-E-D-L-E. B-E-E-D-L-E. Don't ask him what he thinks of safe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, closing thoughts is this. Um, uh, in all of this, right, I, I really like to keep that focus on delivery value. Uh, I think um, uh, what I really want to do is be able to uh, make sure the teams are always working on, on valuable stuff, have, be able to drive the value in. Uh, I like to, then you can't get rid of all your tendencies because the tendencies do slow you down. And, uh, and I love this lean concept. Uh, think big but act small. I love the concept of uh, creating effective delivery teams and we're leveraging that. Okay, with that said, I'm going to open this. Oh, yeah. My training courses come to my classes. I'm the gym. Jim's a good guy, too. Right. <laughs> That's my contact information. Were you just distributing this? This is on my slideshow right now. So if you go to slideshare.net and look for Richard Chang, you'll find it. Do you guys uh, host these files anywhere? So you have the file. You're welcome to post it on your uh, website, too. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, also, um, this last class is a little pricey. Uh, and anyone that wants to attend, uh, Kareem said that he would give anyone tonight 25% uh, off uh, for anyone that emails uh, me. So Kareem has the information to email me. He said he would do that for the attendees tonight. Um, 